do, guys, got a load of questions. Um, some of these I've actually written down based on stuff people have asked before. And a lot of this stuff I just blindsided quite simply because the information's already there. Um, but I'm going to go through these anyway because they'll be interesting topics anyway. The first one is, am I anti-woman and anti-feminist? The answer is no. Um, feminism is a choice. And as such people are entitled to their own opinions or whatever. Where I have an issue is when it starts impacting everybody else, even when it doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make me anti-feminist, it just means a lot of the feminism stuff is getting to a point where it, it's ludicrous. Um, like for example, wanting different size guns, um, which is one of the things for the British Army, that was something that was brought up. Marching in a different step, because women have shorter legs. Those sort of things, are not a case of just accommodating. You have to change the the whole thing um, because at the end of the day, it's supposed to be combat ready. Marches are not just about ceremonial duties. There's, an, there's a whole ream of stuff behind it. And the point is no, none of that stuff gets taken into account. So that's not being anti-woman. And it's, it, it's a injection of common sense. And, same with the pay thing. You know, you can't say we want equality but not actually want equality. That's not common sense either. It has a lot of costs that are going to impl implicate the a lot of government organisations over the next 20 years as people come up to retirement because they were never, um, the pay structure, etc., was never aligned for it. And it doesn't mean that somebody, um, well, when you compare it with the truck, the bin truck driver and mooring the cleaner and saying they should be on the same even though the guy's actually got a lot more responsibilities out of hours, da da da, then they have brought the pay up, but the problem is the pension funds and the allocation of those funds annually have not been allocated. This is why there's been massive sell-offs and it's not logical, it doesn't make sense. But it doesn't make me anti-woman, it makes me pro-common sense. In the same way, I have no issue with women. It's This is a big thing about the, the MGTOW stuff. A lot of guys do not hate Western women. They just do not want to engage with them. They do not want a sexual relationship. They do not want, I know a lot of guys don't even want any relationship whatsoever. The point being is, that's a choice in the same way as people choose to be a feminist. It's a freedom of choice. And what I find funny is the women that get so argumentative about it that when somebody says, I'm not interested. And that, that's the bizarre thing. But we'll get down there. There's a, a, a few things on here. Uh, why don't I go to the UK? I don't like the UK. I'll be honest with you. Um, I moved to the UK in 1989. I'd been there a couple of times as a child, but predominantly I've lived in Germany, Hong Kong, and other places around the world. I have spent a lot of time in a lot of other communities and found the places I've been to be a much more family oriented environment and culturally a better environment and not driven in the same way as we find in the UK that as I mentioned before a friend was charging his own brother for computer repairs. I come from a, a military upbringing, we look after each other. You know, if somebody's car's broke down, you fix it. If you work all night and fix it, that's what you do. It's not about payment. It's because you're you're part and parcel of the same same thing. Um, I find in the UK everything is money driven. Even the local authorities are parasitical on that sense. Um, they are charging for services that you're not getting. Because most of the, what a lot of people don't realize, a lot of the money is actually allocated is purely for pensions. It's purely for pensions. It is not going into the local bus service or whatever. It's pension funds um, because of the way the system's set up. So in response to that is, I don't like the UK. Don't like what it's become. Um, what, I'm not flag waving, whatever. No, I'm not. But then again, look at the disgruntled thing relating to migrants, illegal immigration, split families that are trying to get their non-EU family members into the UK. Um, the corruption, Carillion, for example, and the way that that's pandemic in the UK. That goes on a lot. 
and a lot of people just don't see it and a lot of people don't want to say they know about it. Even when I brought up the stuff about Quillian a few years back before it collapsed and warned people of it, I actually had people unfriend me on LinkedIn to distance themselves from me actually saying what's actually going on. Bear in mind, they weren't actually saying anything themselves at all, but they were concerned that somebody might see that we know each other. That's how paranoid people have become. Um, things like the GCHQ hacks on things like Yahoo Messengers and stuff. When it happened, nobody even batted an eyelid because they were talking about the number of body parts and stuff they see, you know, people doing things on webcams and things. Yet yeah, nobody batted an eyelid that it was completely illegal. There, there's a prime example. It, that's why, you know, there is no freedom in the UK, it's false freedom. London has more cameras per square meter than anywhere else on the planet, as far as I'm aware. I think it's over 28,000 security cameras in central London. That says a lot. A corrupt government, a stagnant corrupt government. Welcome to the UK. Um, somebody mentioned today, I'm a hypocrite because I got married before. No, I didn't. See, the thing is, I'm not religious. That's the, that's the important thing here. The only reason I got married to my wife is she is religious. But from my point of view, it's a contractual obligation. That's why I wouldn't marry before. Because I do commit to things. And my wife commits because she's only having one husband and I'm it. In the same way I commit to this lifelong commitment, I can't commit from a um, contractual obligation. Um, it may sound very cut and dry in that way, but uh, I can't take it from a religious view because I haven't got any religion in me. <laughs> I've got to take it from the fact that my wife believes in this strongly and the importance of it and the family unit and everything, which a lot of, including myself, is what I strive for, which is, you know, what makes me content is the family unit. You know, I've got a loving, caring wife, I've got wonderful kids, etc. That's the family unit. Now, that isn't happening in many places anymore, thanks to the way things are so skewed. And I, I do call it have your cake and eat it, because a lot of time it is have your cake and eat it. Um, because women want the, to be successful, this, that, and the other. At the same time, it's all skewed. Because I want the bigger house, the bigger car, and everything else. I mean, my, my sister, for example, I'm, when she meets somebody, she mentions the value of her new house. Nobody cares. Nobody's seen your house. It's not like you're walking around the house and say, oh, this is a nice house, how much this cost? She has to make it so materialistic, it's just vulgar. Um, but like I said, I don't, don't dwell on that stuff too much, but I'm not a fan of the UK. My kids have a better education system here, better weather, multilingual, and good lifestyle. The UK, there's a lot of stuff that's hidden. The drug abuse, the um, violence, the gang, gang crime, gun crime, knife crime, fudging figures on burglaries because it's related to all of the above. Um, I'm tired of it. I used to analyze all the data. I can see a lot of the patterns that people don't see. In the same way, I can see things that other people can't see relating to. If you if you know how to search for the <laughs> the crime areas, um, something, if you're looking for a house, learn how to do that, because you'll find out where the worst crimes are. So if a house looks cheap, there's probably a reason to it, probably five burglaries, burglaries that year. Um, but anyway, that's, I don't like the UK. <laughs> Uh, scam businesses. I haven't had any scam businesses. The funny thing is, the, this is the this is by some sad individuals out in the Philippines. Um, the call centre, hundred percent legal. The, the permits are still actually on the wall in the building. Um, the mayor's doctor, uh, daughter used to work for me. Um, the same as we've had barangay uh, captains' kids work for us. Several people that own the resorts, their kids have worked for us. The reality is, a lot of local businesses were tied with us um, because of the way it was operating and we were encouraging people that may not have had a university or college degree, which is often pushed in the Philippines is needed for a call center. Um, I don't know why somebody needs to have spent a small fortune on getting an education 
and needs their qualifications to be told where to go on the telephone 20 times a day. Well, that's actually about 200 times a day told to why you keep calling me, why don't you? Yeah, so we actually put a lot of people to work that would have struggled and a lot of time would never have got into the call center industry without that. That's why a lot of people actually like working for us. Other ventures, um, the ventures they make up they, they didn't exist in the first place. This is why I've sort of um, had a laugh at their expense because the point being is these things never existed and they'd be, they wouldn't make any sense. But also, as I said to one of these trolls, I says, when oh, you're blacklisted and wanted in the Philippines and all this stuff, I says, why do, why do you expect that I'm gonna engage with you here? Why do you think I have no time for your nonsense? And it's very simple. Are you going to apologize when I'm in the Philippines? The answer is no, of course not. And that's the point, they went quiet. And then they've tried to do something else, but they're not as active as they used to be because they look stupid. Um, it's the same with the apartments and stuff that a few of the guys live in now. Um, they were saying they didn't exist. And now there's guys living in them actually doing YouTube videos from them. Um, and then it's like, uh, what's next? Because we're every time we lie about something, there's actually facts coming out. Um, in the same way, they're trolling the guys that are in the apartments, and even that I find a little bit sad. The guys are just doing their own thing, not really bothering anybody. People I brought up about the e-begging stuff, I, don't, I mean, I don't actually watch their YouTube stuff. So firstly, I'm a landlord. I'm not their keeper. They're not, they're not married to me. But secondly, from the stuff I have c covered and seen, it's like when Barry needed new teeth. And if you ask me, should I donate money to Barry wanting new teeth? I say, no, it's his own bloody problem. There you go, bit of common sense. It's not your problem to fix. But if people choose to fix his teeth and send him $20 or whatever for, for that, so what? That's their choice. They like the guy even if you hate him. Um, but a lot of this is guys that have simply got too much time on their hands. And this is one of the things I will say about um, the Philippines and the expat community. It's riddled with them. Um, there is a lot of guys that have gone out there with the expectation of doing X, Y, Z. They've gone out there with their budget that is not big enough. They've gone out there with the expectation of living on a paradise island and stuff and then realized it's not good living on the Paradise Island even if you are, because the Paradise Island has limited infrastructure because that's why there's less people living there. Um, so when there's power cuts, because they only have three, three, three hours of power a day, which some islands do in the Philippines, they're not happy about it. But that's the postcard that's sat on their desk for the last 20 years. Now, these guys have a lot of time on their hands, and a lot of tanduai, a lot of red horse and whatever, and they're disgruntled at the world, and often a lot of that is aimed at other people. My stuff relating to the Philippines was focused on doing all these different projects when I first went there. I'm gonna try and boot the hard drive up and see if I can recover uh, some of this stuff that's on one of the servers somewhere. Um, because it's things like having a piggery, pig fattening, and also breeding pigs, um, pace of pace machines, internet calf. Um, there was like about 12 different types of businesses. And we tried them all. We all had, every one of them was successful, but it's a degree of success in the sense that ROI, we got all our money back, we made a profit, but was it worth investing that amount of time into it? Sometimes it's not. But one of the fundamental things I recognize is if you had a selection of these things that work well and have your free time as well, that's the ideal setup for the Philippines. And that's what we had. Because renting out the apartments, having peso peso machines, which are coin slot internet calf machines, and a few other bits and pieces, we existed in the Philippines quite well. And I say exist in the sense that we couldn't have a tropical holiday, a holiday to, well, we're in the tropics anyway. We couldn't have a holiday to Disney World, let's just say that. Um, but we were financially stable. We had a budget for medical emergencies. We had um, a good standard of living. We were pretty much doing what we wanted. Um, and that's the reality. And some people 
do not like the fact that you did it. And it's bizarre. And then they'll go, well, you shouldn't share all this information online. Why are you doing this? Well, it's like, it's none of your business. Um, but no, never done anything scam. Never been interested. I work for the Ministry of Defense, HMRC, um, the prison service, the Ministry of Justice, um, overseas companies. The only time I have not been able to actually work for a government body was because of my time in the Middle East, which puts a five year window. Um, basically, you cannot work in certain things for five years. It did not stop me doing it working within the prison service. It did not work stop me working with um, the Ministry of Defense, uh, not on their research side, USAF, United States Air Force. I couldn't work in their sites, uh, but that was a different time anyway. The guys who were at USAF when I was in the Middle East. Um, but the, the point being, at the time that I couldn't do it was for a, a very for a five year period, which was for the HMRC, HM Revenues and Customs, um, and that's because they have a very strict policy on anybody that's been to the Middle East or what they deem as high risk countries. It's not allowed for five years. Beyond that, I'm still working at MOD, still working for the prison, still working for many other government agencies including the NHS and other people, but HMRC was the only one that had this policy. Um, but still have a full security disclosure, um, still have clearance uh, by the police as well. I have my NBI clearance from the Philippines as well. And quite simply, I'm more legal and above board than most people because of the environments that I work in. Hope that helps on that one. So the answer to that is I can't afford to run some scam business. It would actually be a very, very stupid risk to me um, because of the people I work with. Um, bankrupt and broke, also complete nonsense. Financially, I have always been more than capable. If financially we were struggling here, then I would just hop on a plane and pick up a three month contract and three months in the UK is enough for me for 12 months in Spain or the Philippines. You also got to understand that financially I'm generating revenue all the time anyway. Um, in the Philippines, for example, there is enough money in the Philippines for me to actually live there for about a year and a half as a family without having to even look at any other income because things like this money, YouTube money, it goes there. I don't keep it, it just sits in the bank in, in the Philippines. You have to bear in mind, I haven't been back for three years. I was, only, I was back a few weeks ago, that's the first time in three years. And like uh, when I was talking to Jane Barry, I said, well, do you need to transfer money? It's like, no, I've got plenty of money here already. That's something I want to point out financially. I'm more than capable and stable. And also from a background that is in demand. It's in demand. A lot of people do not do what I do relating to the auditing, the surveying. And because it's not just the surveying, I actually build the systems for it. Um, I also map all the, I've, I've covered it on a spreadsheet before, the, the basics of it. But I design all the asset integrity frameworks from the ground up for very large companies and large corporations and government organizations. I analyze all their risks and where they haven't been maintaining and what's missing from their maintenance registers and all that stuff. And I also analyze what is a risk in the sense of have they updated it? Has the procedures been superseded? When is this equipment due for obsolescence? What is the policies relating to this? What gas is in their air conditioning system? Is it obsolete? Is it things like um, something that needs to be like R22 gas, which should have been replaced already? But that's what I specialize in. Along with the ability to actually run these contracts. Um, for example, when I was in Oman, there was me and Phil. Me and Phil were the ones that actually setting up the contract for Shell Oil and PDO. PDO Shell Oman. Um, PDO is Petroleum Development Oman. And what we were there for <coughs> was setting up all the maintenance contracts for the 
locations throughout the desert and their central site in Muscat. Um, to give you an idea of some of these locations, the largest one in the desert has 30,000 employees on it. These are the guys that work in the oil fields. As such, we're responsible for the accommodation, the logistics, the food resources, everything right down to irrigation of the plant, all the way up to the airport and the sewage treatment plants. And a 22 kilometer pipeline from sea uh, that produces uh, the drinking water for a lot of these uh, locations. So that's what I do. That's what I specialize in. Not many people do it. Simple as that. Can't get a woman in your own country. Also wrong. First thing is, financially, as I've mentioned, I've always been financially capable anyway. If I'd stayed in the UK, stayed with the corporate side, women are not an issue. I just got no interest in those women. That is it. I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. There is no interest for me in women from the UK whatsoever. Um, it's just... It's just not my thing. You know, at the end of the day, as the MGTOW stuff sort of coming along, you start to see why. You know, at the end of the day, a lot of people are thinking the same thing. What I find funny is how a lot of women become defensive on it rather than recognizing there's a problem. Um, there's, a, there's a justification that men should do this, men should do that. Yet no point are they realizing, like for example, marriage. There is no benefit to a man getting married these days. Um, not in the UK. If we went to India, for example, there's a dowry. The dowry is a transfer of wealth from the woman's family to that family as a new family start. So there's a dowry involved. But in the West, there's nothing. The wedding is not a commitment based on religion from both parties. It's often a Kardashian type thing where they have low morals and everything else. It's more about the uh, getting rich quick. And as such, the risks increase for, for men. And that's one of the reasons MGTOW is growing. Uh, from my point of view, I had to see very interesting the women. Because from the capacity, capacity within my business, the women are often very argumentative. Um, not because they're, I mean, Glenn put it, um, the way he puts it is when they're nagging about something, he says, you're not talking to your husband. Um, because they they don't really handle the stress too well. The, the women I've worked with, they do not handle the stress too well. Um, a lot of the guys don't. The fail rate at my level is most people are retired by 55 or died. The, most people have gone off with ill health, died, or being phased out quite, quite simply it's, it's quite a stressful job but the way I do it is very simple I don't do it all year round you go in there disconnect yourself from all the the crap that goes on around you you focus on the objective which is kickstarting a contract transition of a contract evaluation of a contract whatever and then you disconnect and come back out if you stay too long you get involved in the politics, and this is where a lot of this goes on. They're asking you what car you've got, because a car within a corporation will define what grade you're on financially. And this is this sort of petty crap that goes on. And the guys do it just as much as the women, but I'd say there's no way I'd want to date one of those women. And I definitely wouldn't date the guys either. But the whole point is, within the business, they are not women I would actually socialize in any form. Even if you went out, there would be back chatting behind your back. The guys do it. The guys will take engineers out for a drink to find out information on which are the worst engineers and whatever for the ones to get rid of. That's the way they work. It's very clinical, very surgical, and very backhanded. It's not me. I have too much of a moral compass. I was bo born and bred an engineer, so <clears throat> I'm used to working with the guys, doing what the, the guys do, and I've worked my way up. So at the end of the day, when they go, oh, can you go and find out? I'm like, no, that's not what I'm here for. Other guys go, okay. If I get a promotion out of it, do you want me to play golf on Saturday? You know, always pushing for the next promotion. Um, but yeah, it's not, I can't get a woman in my own country. I'm not interested. 
at all, zero interest. And I find the MGTOW stuff I've covered already covers many of the reasons why. Uh, why don't I show more about my family? Because my family had nothing to do with my YouTube stuff. My family unit is my family unit. They are, we are not sold as a, um, what do you call it? Uh, we're not the husbands, <laughs> you know? At the end of the day, this is my channel. My family and stuff are my family life as such that I don't show much about them. They're just separated. Simple as that, they have their own privacy. I'm not forcing them to do something um, that sh they should, <laughs> I'm not forcing them to be some doing something they don't want to do, but also I'm not going to coerce or ask them to do it anyway. If they want to do YouTube stuff, they do anyway, you know, at the end of the day. But uh, ultimately, uh, my family life's family life. And one of the things you will see a lot of people doing with the cameras and stuff, whether they're at concerts or like this, um, what you won't see, this is why when I'm at some of these locations, you don't see a lot of the photos and videos and stuff, is because there aren't any. Because do you know what we're doing? We're experiencing those locations. Not everywhere I go is about making a video. Um, for example, when we go to uh, Barcelona or whatever, we're doing it as a family thing. Although there's some videos of the video footage in the car or um, there's some video footage of some of the locations, predominantly you're not gonna get too much information because we're doing a family thing. And as such, that takes priority over the YouTube. Although some people say, what? Why, why don't you do this or that? Because you can't do both at the same time. Um, for example, if I was going to Mercia, I'd have to spend at least one to two days in Mercia doing videos. And that'd be focused on making the right videos and everything else, which means you wouldn't spend any time with your family, which defeats the object of doing it for me. You know, then the day, these videos are more about information. It's not financial gain. Um, there's plenty of other people out there that do the, the touristy stuff anyway. Um, why are you trolled? Well, the answer to that is lots of people get trolled. Um, having over 10,000 subscribers is a prime example of why you get trolled because you have a broad spectrum of people that are here for different information. But along with that, the internet has a broad selection of trolls that have different reasons for trolling. One of my original trolls, um, he he was a, well, he still is. I, I mean, I'm not sure if he's dead or not, but. It, I think he actually has some issues mentally. Um, he had something happen to him in the Philippines to the point that he left and moved countries. Um, and now this giant, this joke, yeah, I think that was the, the, the first word was right. Um, would say that I was blacklisted from the UK and wanted in the UK and everything. Then I went back there to work. And then obviously when I moved to Europe, I was blacklisted in the Philippines and all this sort of stuff. What I find funny is how some people would actually look at any of this stuff. Well, and I would have to say, it's a very limited amount of people. Because the majority of people can see from his style of writing, there is something wrong with the guy. And somebody is, uh, mentions, why, why does he hate me? Well, there's a very simple reason that he started writing this fake um, wall of shame thing years ago. I wasn't on it at the time. But I recognized several of the people on there. And I asked them about it. Why are you on there? And you found out the majority of the people come from Link, which is a living in Cebu forum. Um, and this troll had been on there and banned multiple times for this stuff he does, because he incites argumentative post and one of the things I have mentioned about the forums is they are a toxic environment generally because there's too many people either opinionated argumentative drunk mental disorders or whatever to the point I don't use them I can't be bothered with it but he would actually go on there and ask things about the price of a a girl or something like that and get people arguing with each other it's the same with what he did with Chris Bennett, because Chris Bennett had a issue relating to his ex-girlfriend, an ex-girlfriend that um, had a child that was bi biologically not his, um, but he wanted to see the kid and there's access issues, but the, this other guy was involved um, that was basically um, coerced the girl from <laughs> Chris and ended up dating the girl and whatever. But then they, Chris wanted access to the child anyway because he'd had an attachment with him. 
Um, so he agreed to pay some financial money on a monthly basis. Paid the first payment and they never let him see the kid. Now bear in mind, the kid's not his anyway. He has no financial obligation for this. But instead they try to file a case against him that he's not paying child support. It's not his child. <laughs> um, so he then went to the court on the for this case and they put the information forward because obviously the child's not his anyway. But they put this article in the newspaper that he's wanted for this um, thing and yet was actually completely fabricated and false. Because um, it gets filed under certain specific things within the Philippines law. Um, but he turned up at the court case with all his paperwork and everything in order to show, put his case forward to the fact that the kid's not his anyway, they hadn't shown up, etc, etc. And they didn't show up at the court case. And that was that. And he's got all the documents relating to that. And the troll um, was actually on living in Cebu forums and stirring the pot between Chris and this other guy, along with these other bits and pieces going on in between. He had nothing to do with it. He was just a nosy old fart with nothing better to do with his time. Uh, dogs are fighting outside. Um, so the, the point being is, this is the thing. When I started talking to these different people, I started to see this guy was a moderator on Living in Cebu. This guy was attacked by this guy on Living in Cebu. This guy is the owner of Living in Cebu. These are the four guys and moderators in Living in Cebu. And then when you start looking at the troll, you go back all the way into Yahoo groups. And the guy's been doing it since 2005. Now, people ask me why is he annoyed with me, it's because I put all that information out there so that people are aware that this sad individual is not only doing this, but here's all the information relating to it. I did the same with JLB. Um, JLB, by the way, he's, he seems to have gone off and done his own thing now, um, but at the same time, um, he was doing stuff that was just childish, childish and pathetic. But once I looked in, analyzed himself, and got all this information together, he stopped doing it. This other guy, on the other hand, I don't think he's got anything else going on in his life. He's still working in retirement. Um, I've seen his tax returns. <laughs> um, he's not wealthy, he's not doing well, he's not living in a nice big house or something else but a lot of the time trolls have this fake persona they like to do they like to project that they're doing well and successful but they aren't um and that's what's sad about it you know just being on the computer all day is their life and they want to have the ability to be judgmental and have something to say but as i've said before to other people when i was saying this to um jane barry a couple of weeks back, because they're getting trolled. I says the thing is, they're on about the you know the stuff they're getting trolled about is about what's called e begging, which is asking for asking for money on things like YouTube videos. I says the thing is they make it out as a crime. What they're doing is actually not a crime because they're it's just the way they're doing it. You know, at the end of the day, some people there go, okay, I'll give you ten dollars for your your teeth to get fixed or whatever. I don't. And for me, I don't know why anybody would give somebody money for getting their teeth fixed, but hey ho that's up to them but as I said to Jay and Barry I cannot understand why these sad individuals do not focus on real issues there is a lot of crime in the locations they're in because um, not just the Philippines because a lot of these guys are not in the Philippines a lot of them have had issues and left the Philippines a long time ago um, and often are divorced as well and which does ask the question why they're still dwelling on it um, but Ultimately, they could be doing a lot more productive stuff, and but they choose not to. It's dwelling on stuff that they want to feel important or whatever. I don't know, but for me, it's just sad, and I, I just can't be bothered with it. And now I'll ask my question, why do I still dwell on the Philippines? I'm still very, very well connected with the Philippines. As you probably are aware, when I come back from the, from the Philippines, I'm talking about the carbon trust and things like that, because I'm interested from a business point of view. I'm interested in cleaning up a lot of the plastics that are out there. I'm interested from a perspective of our power plants. But on top of that, 
we still have property there. We still have a lot of family there. And now all our paperwork's sorted. We can come and go to the Philippines as and when. Up until that point, we were sort of stuck in limbo. So though we've been sort of, took three years to get here, that part of the journey is now finished. We can actually now start traveling backwards and forwards. So the answer to that is, I'm still tied with the Philippines. The last trip I went back, I did not have enough time to cover the stuff I needed to. The first thing I had is I had some major jet lag for some reason. Um, but I can understand some of it because I've been traveling from, I went from Torrevieja to Madrid. And we're um, arriving in Madrid about midnight. Then I was stuck there for 12 hours. Uh, then got the, the plane. And then I was stuck in Hong Kong for hours. And then I ended up in the Philippines. So I ended up that I've traveled for two days, but I hadn't slept for three. So only being there for around 10 days, the jet lag was quite bad. <laughs> and then when you come back, it was fine. Because one of the things I realized when I come back to Spain is my time zone, my body clock, hadn't changed because they hadn't had enough time to do it. Um, but there's loads of stuff I want to do in the Philippines when I go back next time. And I'm better geared up. I did t one of the things I do recommend is don't take too much camera equipment. I took way too much this time. I didn't have enough time to use most of it. Um, I'm going to take the GoPros again next time. I'm going to take my mobile phone. I'll take the camcorder because it's waterproof, but I'm not going to take my um, DSLR camera and the, the lenses and stuff. I simply don't use it. And, and from a financial point of view, if I was doing stuff related to... Um, photography most of the stuff you come across in the Philippines relating to what I'd be covering involves people there's no money in photographs for people <laughs> so I'll be honest with you there is some stuff that I come across the other day I'm thinking that could be a potential venture but we'll get there as and when so that's why why do you still dwell in the Philippines because I'm still attached to the Philippines Philippines is still very much home for me if you ask me where is home, I would say Philippines and Spain for two different. My family's in Spain, but Philippines is where I like being. You know, at the end of the day, that is a place I enjoy. I like things being unregulated and unsafe. <laughs> I've got a bit. Well, in the UK is such a nanny state now. I just it's just boring. You know, and I know lots of people get killed and stuff. It's not that. It's the fact is the ability to use a bit of common sense yourself without, you know, the, the ability to do things for yourself is one of the things you get from the Philippines. In the UK, everything is so regime. But also, the comparison, like here in Spain, in the UK, if I was building a swimming pool like this guy over here, and put crap all over the road like he's done, like he's lined up all his hollow blocks along the road. No, um, what do you call it? There's no reflective tape, there's no uh, night lights or anything on it, he just stuck them in the road. In the UK, within about an hour and a half, somebody will report that to the council. This guy's been doing it for nearly two weeks, nobody cares. And that's, there's a prime example of a difference. Is that right or wrong? In my personal opinion, if he hurt somebody, sue him. Simple as that. But should people constantly box themselves in by, like, in the UK, if you did that, you'd be worried that, oh, if I put that on the road, one of, one of the neighbours is going to report me. What sort of environment is that? Like, we've got the Stasi there. And that's, that's why I like Philippines and Spain. Different. Yes, sometimes it's irritating. For example, he's taken up about 10 parking spaces. But at the same time, you'll be finished in another week or two. That's it. I don't, it's, it's not really bothering me too much, except when he's drilling or something, because I can't do any videos. And I've just noticed he has got a large, he's got a large, um, he's got a large oven there, which is ideal for baked potatoes, it's the same style. But anyway, because he's ripped all these trees down while he's putting the pool in. Um, I'm not MGTOW, and MGTOW may get offended by the stuff I bring up. As I mentioned before, before I met my wife, I was actually happy being single. So at that point, I would have been MGTOW if I hadn't gone to the Philippines and randomly, and had randomly met 
and my wife online through my uh, friends, <laughs> my friends signing up on a dating website. Um, so from that point of view, I would have been MGTOW. And that's why a lot of my viewpoints are tied with that. I understand the relationship with the court systems, dealt with that. Um, and that gets onto another thing. Do I have an estranged relationship with my ex-partner or my daughter with her? The answer to that is no. There is no issues with my ex or my daughter. My ex was actually at my mother's funeral. Um, and, you know, along with my daughter. There is no... See, the thing with me is, as I've mentioned, I have no interest in Western women. And I, even with my ex-partner, there is nothing with me. I, I feel nothing. I mean, I'll be honest with you. There is nothing there at all. It's not like anger or anything. I just don't feel nothing. And it's, it's not a case of... Have I, have I suddenly just lost the interest because of such bad things or whatever? It's just simply, when I met my wife, it was so different that at no point would I even consider looking at a Western woman. It's as simple as that. And it's not because I'm sort of cutting people off like this. It's simply, there is nothing there. I don't find them attractive. I don't find them... Um, I, yeah, it's just nothing. Now, don't get me wrong. Companionship-wise, in the sense of having female friends, a bit different. Because I like I talk to people exactly the same. You know, at the end of the day, you don't have to have that sort of connection um, to have debates with people, or discussions, or do like that go the camera club and things. Because even at the camera club, there is issues relating to some of these people that are coming out of the NHS and other jobs where they've got nice ring fence, pensions, retire early, go off and retire early at taxpayers' expense, etc. Um, but they don't, they've never been in a real world environment. As such, they're wrapped in cotton wool, but it doesn't mean that you can't have a common um, objective or interest, which in that case is photography. You just don't get into conversations about women's rights and things like that because um, like I said, the, the whole thing about the, the car and the four women getting to somewhere, it was like, nobody's even interested in hearing it. It's not funny. It's not, it's not correct. <laughs> and nobody was interested. Um, but anyway, so from the MGTOW point of view, the first thing is, if I'd done a lot of stuff I did when I was younger, down the MGTOW route, um, I would have changed a lot of things. Financially, I'd have been a lot better off, without a doubt. Without a doubt. I did do a lot of partying in my younger years. Um, I would have been more focused on some of this stuff. Don't mean it didn't come out quite well. I mean, at the end of the day, it was, I'd be out clubbing on a night and still be in college in the morning. I, it would, I'd still got through it, but at the end of the day, I wasted so much money on women and alcohol. Um, that quite simply I'd even better off do it, using it somewhere else. But that's hindsight. My dad went through the same thing. When he was in the military, one of the first things they had when they joined the army was somebody advising them not to go out drinking or whatever, invest in a house. Because even when you're overseas, you rent it out, it'll pay for itself and buy another one. Da, 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 da. Yeah, of course you do. <laughs> so ultimately, things have changed on that. But also... Relationship-wise, I wouldn't have gone through the same rigmaroles of things I went through. Um, I would actually have, yeah, I would have probably, I would have still had some relationships, don't get me wrong, I wouldn't have been 100% MGTOW in the sense I would have no engagement with women, but I would have certainly been more protective. Um, I would have, would have had a lot more stuff going on in a positive way. Um, I wouldn't have got roped into some of the stuff I did do in the past, but, that's life. And that's one of the things I do recognize is that even though some people may actually have issues with their past, myself, I have no issues at all. I just put down the experience. I may not get that time back. Well, I will never get that time back. But at the same time, there is always good and bad anyway. You know, you have good times, you have bad times. It's experience. It's the yin and yang. It's a balance. But at the same time, if you had more information, better informed and like this thing was, I mean, like I said, I haven't been married before with my wife. Um, but funny enough, that would actually tie a little bit into MGTOW in the sense that I recognize it's an obligation. 
Um, but there was no advantage to me because I wasn't religious. And one of the things that stopped it was they wanted me to convert to being a Catholic and I wouldn't convert because I, I don't want a religion. I don't want one. Um, my birth certificate says Protestant because my parents made me a Protestant. And religion is one of those things I have no interest in. And uh, some, you know, some people have asked me if I looked at it and should look at it. And honestly, I don't think it's relative for me. You know, at the end of the day, everyone has their own own thing that they're interested in. Um, myself, it, it's not like I'm seeking a world peace or um, need to feel content or anything like that. I already am content. Religion does not need to be involved. Um, and that's one of the things I have without religion. And a lot of people seek religion for a release or um, dealing with a problem. An example of that is some of the guys my father come across at McDonald's where they were homeless at McDonald's. They cleaned themselves up, got jobs at McDonald's and were off going doing some religious uh, thing over in Africa. That's what they were saving up for. But the point is, from that point of view, I have no issue with religion because that, that viewpoint is actually empowered people. What put me off religion a lot is the child abuse and the covering up. And it's, I mean, it seems to be stagnant. It seems to be in most religions. Because um, it's very hard to say it's in all or it's not in some or whatever, because you don't know. Because these things have been covered up for centuries. Um, so it's very hard to have all the information, but I've seen the stuff in the Philippines relating to the Catholic priests. I've seen the stuff relating to Ireland and the Catholic priests. I've seen the stuff relating to stuff that goes on in the United Kingdom, relating to choir boys and all sorts. They are ultimately, how can somebody be preaching something that they see as fundamentally a foundation of their being? And at the same time, committing those types of abuses. If that, if that is accepting, then I don't get it. I never will, because I, for me, that's just wrong, and always will be. There is no justification for that. And I have experienced talking to people who are relating to a board in the Philippines to do with um, seven priests with various. Um, things uh, that they committed and he come and talk to well they come and talk to me so I need two people um, separately because they understood that I just say it as it is and they couldn't say it within the church but they were venting their frustrations by seeing me as somebody they could trust to talk about these things because the leaving of the church is the choice of those priests at no point does it take into account the damage they did to other people. And I know I'm one for separating religion and church from definitely the ivory towers of every slum, the church. Um, but at the same time, I don't need religion. I never have done. Um, but at the same time, I do understand why other people have it. But I've answered all those questions. I can't think of anything else anybody wanted to ask me. Thanks for watching.